Good evening, class. I hope you're having a blessed day today. Today we are in topic number six, knowing God's voice. Topic number six, knowing God's voice. If you have your curriculum, we are on page 34. We are on page 34 of the curriculum. This is one of the most important lessons out of the 23 lessons that are inside the curriculum. Because what we are going to talk about today is so vitally important. Because we're going to go through uh, understanding the fact that you know God's voice. And not only knowing God's voice and the fact that you do hear God, but also the understanding of how to hear God. Things you can do to hear God more clearly. Because I'll go ahead and preview the number one thing that limits the ability to hear from God is distractions. Things that come in your life that, that just kind of get in the way. And we're going to talk about how to remove those distractions today. And we have a lot of additional resources. So we're going to go through the curriculum. We're going to talk about a few extra things as we go. But then at the very end, we're going to go through uh, one big piece of revelation that I want to talk about using a prime example of somebody walking out their purpose and knowing God's voice in the process. We're going to be talking about that today. And one thing I always do want to mention and I said this at the introduction, but I'm going to say it again. There is no class that is comprehensive at Blank Slate Ministries. I can't go through everything I know about knowing God's voice or everything that's in the Bible in general without just teaching you the entire Bible verse by verse. So when we go through these, I'm picking out the most important things to lay your foundation. And then as you study the Word, you can find more understanding as you go but this will lay all of the foundation that you need to know about knowing god's voice that's the big thing i want to give you a solid foundation to run on so if you have questions please reach out and we have a we've already taught this one semester so if you want to go back and watch the previous semester there's probably going to be some things we talk about in the additional resources then that we're not going to talk about today because today I want to focus on a different piece of additional material. So all of the semesters, all the classes, all the resources will be online. And then if you want to go and watch those teachings, you're more than welcome to. But you can pull up the additional resources PDF and it will give you all of the additional verses and all of those kinds of things for you. So let's pray and then we're going to get right into it because we got a lot to talk about today. So Father, I thank you. I pray you bless everybody under the sound of my voice. Let this word become wisdom, revelation, and the knowledge of your son. Spiritual seed sown, producing in our body, mind, will, and emotion. Transforming us by the renewing of our mind. Conforming us into the image of Christ. Growing us up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. God, we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, I, I, even just praying, God's starting to speak to me about some more things. So I'm going to... I'm going to be taking notes as we go because, like I said, there's some things that we're going to talk about this semester that we didn't talk about last semester that I, I definitely want to bring up to you today. So let's go into this. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do, for what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. I can, do my, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. So, this is powerful, because we're talking about John, 15, John 5, 19, and John 5, 30. And let me write this down real fast, church, before I move forward, so I don't forget this. Uh, these will... These will go in the additional resources, but I just want to write those down real fast. So what's going on in this story? Now, if you go back and read in John 5, which we're not going to open up the Bible and go through all of it, so you'll have to read some of this on your own. Jesus healed the man at the well. So this is when Jesus healed the man at the well. Jesus was speaking to the Jews that sought to kill him. So in the story, the Jews sought to kill Jesus, and he spoke, and he was speaking to those Jews. Now, what are the two points Jesus makes about his actions? Jesus says, I do what I see the Father do. And I judge from what I hear the Father say. Now, this is important. And, and we're going to... I'll put this in the notes, too. 
we did an entire week in a Sunday service and even more on uh, Jesus the Judge. So I recommend you go back and watch some of our material on that. But I'm going to give you a two-second overview of what this word judge and judgment means. The judge, the person who is a judge, does one of two things. They either pronounce a sentence of guilt. And a sentence of guilt releases punishment. And in in, in that's what comes from guilt. So guilt equals punishment. So a judge pronounces a sentence and that's what brings forth punishment. The other sentence that a judge can pronounce is innocence. And when a judge pronounces innocence, it's what brings forth vindication in your life. So when Jesus hears of the Father, he's speaking one of two things. He's either speaking uh, guilt or innocence, producing either punishment or vindication over your life. So many people, when they think judgment, what they think is, oh, that's the punishment. They, they equate judgment to punishment. But judgment isn't just punishment, and this is very important. Because when you take communion, we're definitely talking about things we didn't talk about last semester. When we talk about communion, the point of communion is says if we would judge our flesh, we should not be judged. When we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. And the whole point of communion is to refocus yourself on the Lord, to reposition and relook at the Lord. We don't have time to talk about communion today. But the thing I want you to know is that when you take communion, what you're judging is innocence over your life because of the blood. You refocus on the blood of the Lord, which brought forth innocence in your life. It's what brought reconciliation back to God. It's what brought redemption, salvation coming through the blood of Jesus. So when this judgment comes from the Father to you, about you, to it, when the judgment of the Father comes about you through Jesus, that word is vindication because your sentence is innocent. So what you're hearing from the Father is your rightful place, not because you earned it, but because you're born again. When you got saved, you became a co-heir with Christ. So it became your inheritance. It is God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. If I don't write these down, church, I'm not going to be able to remember them. So I, I'm just trying to write down these notes as I go. So God wants you to have these things. And this is what he pronounces in your life. So the first part I want you to know about knowing God's voice is the fact that you do, we're going to talk about it more, but you do know it. And I want you to know that what you're hearing from God is not just the plan and the walk and the purpose of God, but what you hear when it talks about judgment is innocence over your life. It is, is vindication. The, 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 the Father is not sitting there in heaven bringing up every little bit of your sin, bringing condemnation. The devil is the accuser. The devil is the accuser. The Holy Spirit's job The Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Man, we are really doing some things I didn't think we were going to talk about today. The Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And it says, of sin, because they believe not on me. That's a singular sin. That sin that the Holy Spirit convicts of or tells you about is to get born again. So once you get born again, the Holy Spirit's not talking about sin with you anymore. And then it says, of righteousness, and it says, because I go to the Father and they see me no more. This is red letter. Jesus is saying this. So he's saying the Spirit is going to tell you of your right standing with God because you don't see me anymore for me to tell you. And then he says, of judgment, not your judgment, he says the judgment of the enemy because the because the, the God of this world is judged. He said, so the Spirit's job, what the Spirit tells you from the Father is to get born again. And then once you're born again, the Spirit tells you, hey, look at your right standing and look at the judged, the, 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 the enemy that is defeated. The enemy's defeat and your right standing before the Father because of what Jesus did on the cross is what liberates your heart to live for God. 
I hope this is blessing you. I'm trying to go through these kind of quick so we don't run over time. But but let's let's talk about a couple other things. It says in Hebrews 1, it says Jesus was the express image of the Father. That's in the additional resources from last semester. So when Jesus came and lived on the earth, he lived demonstrating the Father completely to us. That's that was what he was doing. He was showing us the Father. And in in Galatians 2:20 it says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ was dead in vain. And we're going to talk about Galatians 2, 20 and 21 in the next three, four weeks a lot. We're going to be talking about grace and faith here very soon. But when Jesus says, I was the express image, and then in Galatians 2, it says, your life lived now is the faith of the Son of God. And to give you a simple understanding before we get into it, it's, I know it's two weeks before we can talk about this, but faith is connection to God. That's the simple definition. So Jesus says, the way you live is connected to God because of me. That's why... In Romans 12, 1 to 3, you're supposed to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So, and then we also know that you're supposed to grow up in the measure and the stature of the fullness of Christ. So if you hear me pray before I start every lesson, I always say, transform us by the renewing of our mind. Grow us up into the measure and the stature and the fullness of Christ. I'm always praying these prayers about us coming up to walk like Christ, connected to God and hearing God's voice clearly so we can walk out our purpose with God. Does that make sense? I hope this is blessing you. St stay with me just one more second. Let's read one more additional resource and then we're going to dive into trying to, we're going to get through the rest of the lesson. And uh, I'll try not to bring forth a bunch of additional stuff until the very end because I want to make sure we finish the lesson today. But listen to this. This is in John 14. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, it sufficeth us. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works." Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto the Father. And whatsoever things, whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments." So over and over and over, there's two things I want you to see before we really get into this lesson. The first thing is that Jesus heard the Father. And what Jesus showed us was a perfect picture of hearing the Father and walking it out with the Father. That you hear and then you walk. That you, that you first hear from God what God wants you to do and then you walk out what God wants you to do. But you got to be able to hear Him. And Jesus said, you hear and if you even have questions about hearing from the Father, he said, look at me, because if you see me, you see the Father. So when you read the Bible and you read everything in red letter and you read what Jesus said, you are hearing from the Father. I don't have time to go into this today, and I'm going to reference it for just one second, and then we're going to move forward. And once we finish this curriculum, all, all 26 weeks, I recommend you take our advanced curriculum because our advanced curriculum is going to go into some of these things I'm talking about today. Just ever, I'm talking about it ever so briefly, but we go into them very much in depth in the advanced curriculum because we have more time. The thing I want to tell you is that what Jesus is saying when he says, if you see me, you see the Father, what he wants you to understand is that walking out purpose with God comes from hearing God. Comes from hearing God. Uh, that's all I'm gonna say. I the the spirit's moving on me, so we got to keep going. I don't want to. I don't want to go too far into it today. 
if if I if I catch what was just coming my way, we'll uh, I'll rebring it up. But the thing I want you to understand is that knowing God's voice is so important. It is so important to know God's voice. And when you know God's voice, which you do, you hear from God. And once you hear from God, it gives you the ability to obey God. Let's keep going. I just want we're going to keep going in the curriculum. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wish ye not that I must be about my father's business? Now it's in Luke 2.49. So in Luke 2.52 is where it says Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and in favor with man. But Luke 2.49 is the story that leads into that passage that so many people quote so often. My home church did a college group about uh ministry in the church and they called it Luke 252 or they called it 252 that was the group name but Luke 249 is the story that leads into it when Jesus is a child and they go to uh, Jerusalem to, to offer I think pay taxes or offer sacrifices we have to go I think pay taxes and then on the way back Mary and Joseph realize oh Jesus got left you know they didn't have him with him they go back and they find him sitting in the synagogue talking with the rabbis, and then he asked this question, did you not know that I was going to be about my father's business? So who is he talking to? He's talking to his mother Mary. Where is Jesus when he says this? He's in the, temp in the temple. Now, how does this show us, what does this show us about the voice of God? Now catch this, what does this verse show us about the voice of God? Jesus could answer questions at a young age. Jesus knew what to say because he listened to God. Hearing from God is important. That even at a very young age, and in everything Jesus do, Jesus put an emphasis on hearing from God, learning from God, you know, studying the scriptures and talking to the rabbis. I mean, they saw the wisdom that he had at a very young age because he spent time with the Father. This is so important. You know, the 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 very little record in the Bible we have of Jesus' childhood and him growing up is a direct emphasis on spending time hearing from God. It's very important. Now let's talk about these next, this, this next passage. This next passage is the fundamental foundation of hearing God's voice. This is, this is where it comes from, John 10. And, you know, I, we're going to get into lessons on faith and confession and things like that very soon. But I want you to know that when you read this parable I'm about to talk about, and you read this parable and you start to confess it and you start to believe it and you start to stand on it. This, this is the truth that brings forth the actual manifestation of hearing God's voice. It comes from this parable. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth. And the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him. And they know his voice, and a stranger will they not follow, but flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Now, I'll give some testimony real quick. I heard from God. I could hear God before I ever moved to Chicago. Before I ever moved here, I heard from God. Very clearly, because I saw prophetic visions that came to pass. So, you know, a month into me being in Chicago, the two main prophetic visions I'd seen from God came to pass. Both of them manifest true power of God. So I, I heard from God. But the first six months I was here, one thing we made a diligent focus on doing was confessing this promise. I hear the voice of the good shepherd, a stranger I will not follow. I said it all the time. There was, there was my prayer partner would, would get me to say it over and over, you know, because I would be walking this road out and sometimes it would seem like you couldn't hear from God. You know, it, it, it seemed like God would go silent or you couldn't hear him or something didn't seem right. And she would say, you hear the voice of God. She said, you'd hear the voice of God. You hear the voice. And for me, I had to agree. I didn't have to say, I know. I had to say, I agree. I hear the voice of God. And that was the confession I started making. I hear the voice of God. A stranger I will not follow. I hear the voice. 
And the more I said it and the more I believed it, the clearer the voice of God became. The more I put distractions away, the clearer the voice became. The more I studied the word, the clearer the voice. I mean, I'm telling you, church, this is how you do it. This is the reason why this is lesson six. Once we got this foundation of your salvation and the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you're able to speak in tongues and, and you being able to really get into the, the basics of intimacy, starting to spend time with God. So we spent a whole week on it last week. You just spending time with the Lord, you know, putting that focus on doing that. The thing I want you to know now is when you're in that intimacy, that secret place with the Lord, you hear God. Explain this parable. The followers of Jesus are the sheep. Jesus is the shepherd. The thief and the robber is the devil. True followers of Jesus will follow him alone and flee from the devil. What do we learn about Jesus' voice in this parable? If you are saved, you know the voice of Jesus. Now, John 10.10, I'm just going to make this note. It says, uh, the enemy cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and life more abundantly. John 10.10 10 is five verses after this passage. And you could go and read all the way to John 10.10. 10. The, the thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. So what I want you to know is that the reason why we flee from the thief is it only is destruction in our life. You know, it's, it's, it, there's nothing good from the thief. But it's life and life abundantly when following Jesus. But the main emphasis of this parable is not just following. Who do you follow? Whether you follow the shepherd or the thief. It's because you know the voice. The ability to hear and to discern from God is what allows you to follow. Your obedience, your following of God is directly dependent on you hearing from God. You, you, you have to know his voice. So what we're going to talk about now is how to know his voice. We're going to talk about things you can do practically to know the voice of God. So let's read this next passage. And it came to pass about in eight days after these saying, he took Peter, John, James, went up to the mountain, prayed, and, he, and as he prayed, they fashions on his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistening, and behold... There talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and they which were with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory. And two men stood with him. And it came to pass as they departed from him, Peter said unto Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elias, not knowing what he said. While he thus spake, there came a cloud and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. There came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. And then when the voice was passed, Jesus was found alone, and they kept it close and told man, no man in those days any of those things which they had seen. So, this passage where, where, where it's spoken, this is my beloved son. This voice of heaven, the voice of the father speaking down about Jesus and saying this is my beloved son happens twice. This is one of the instances. I'll put the other one in the additional resources. But listen to this. Who's involved in the story? Jesus, the father, Peter, James, John, Moses, and Elijah. Now what all do we learn about hearing the voice of God? All of them heard from the glory cloud. They all heard. Also, I want you to know Jesus was intentional to hear from God. And what do I mean by that? Before Jesus goes to be tempted in the wilderness, it's one of the greatest trials Jesus goes through. When he goes to the wilderness, he's led into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. He has an encounter and hears the audible voice of God. John the Baptist takes Jesus, dunks him in the water, pulls him up out of the water. The Holy Spirit descends like a dove, sets on Jesus, and out of heaven says, this is my beloved son. That, that affirmation of the father going into one of the greatest seasons of testing. The Mount of Transfiguration leads to the cross and to Jerusalem. 
They, they talked with Jesus about him dying. The thing he should accomplish at Jerusalem is his death, going to the cross. And he hears the voice, this is my beloved son. It's that affirmation of the father. The father calling out and declaring something about Jesus before he goes into one of the greatest experiences that anybody could face. And this is important because knowing God's voice and hearing it is what gave Jesus the strength to be able to go through that, that, that time of testing, that, 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 that incredible trial, that, that incredible sacrifice of going to the cross only came forth because of his ability to hear from God. I'm going to make this point. There's many other examples of Jesus hearing from the Father in, in the Word and, and being diligent about separating. You know, he left nine disciples at the bottom. He only took three of them with him. And there's other instances like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's a part of the additional resources already. That in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus separates himself out to go and pray to the Father. The same way in the Mount Transfiguration. And both of those instances, something that you can go and study later that would, that's very interesting, is what the disciples did while Jesus was praying. Jesus understood the importance of hearing the Father and knowing the Father's voice to bring forth strength to go into the greatest season of testing that he was going to face. Jesus knew the importance of that. The disciples did at this point not know. Because they had, they, they, you know, there's no salvation yet. Jesus hadn't got born, you know, we hadn't got born again because Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet. So Jesus in the garden and Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration, it said that the disciples fell asleep. They fell asleep. One of the things that's going to have to happen if you want to hear from God clearly is you're going to have to put a focus and you're going to have to put some effort into it. You know, sitting up late praying and fasting and different things like that, which we're only going to go into a little bit in just a minute. And we're going to spend more time going through those as we go through the lessons on faith. But praying and fasting doesn't move God, but it moves you. It moves your heart to hear God. Fasting is what takes away distractions. Fasting is literally the removing and the replacing. You remove distractions and you replace. That's what fasting is all about. And when you go through that process, it's what brings forth a emptiness where you can pray and replace it with time with the Lord to be renewed so you can hear God more clearly. This is why Jesus made a diligent effort at spending time with the Lord. Over and over, he does this. And what I want to look at is we're going to look at three other people in the Bible uh, to go along with Jesus that uh, heard from God. And, and, let, and let's talk about this for just a minute. In Acts 9, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined right about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. So here, who hears the voice of God in this story? Saul and all the men that were around him. You know, all of these people in that moment heard God speak. Now what happens after Saul hears the voice of God? Well, they lead him to Damascus. He fasts and prays. And then he straightway obeyed Jesus. You know, God sent Ananias. Ananias went and prayed for him. You know, God told Ananias. Ananias was like, I don't know about that. He's trying to kill me. You know, he's trying to kill Christians. And God said, you go and tell him because he's got great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And then he goes, he prays for him, and then it says he, he eats, gets, you know, gets his strength back from fasting, and then immediately goes and preaches in the synagogue. 
what I want you to know, and we're going to, we're going to talk about this here in a minute. This is the big additional resource we're going to get to here in just a minute is that once you hear from God, let me tell you, you hear from God, you know, so many times the, the, the thing that gets brought up between now, I'm not going to go there yet. I'll talk about that here in just a second. That thought I was about to say, I will bring up in a minute. Let's, let's finish the lesson first. But I want you to know that here's another person that heard God in the Bible. You know, we're not going to go through every person that heard Jesus or the Father speak in the Bible. But this, look, this is Acts 9. This is a New Testament example of somebody who was not walking with God. This is, this is Saul, who became Paul, who wrote two-thirds in the New Testament, who was actually persecuting Christians, killing Christians, and he heard God. So how much more you, being in the covenant, being born again, hear God? You hear God. Remember, I hear the voice of the Good Shepherd, a stranger I will not follow. I'm going to get to something in a minute that will answer this nagging question, which I know somebody has right now because it's being pulled out of me, saying, but I don't hear God. We're going to talk about that in just a second. But I want to get through the lesson first, and then I'll answer exactly what you're saying right now. So let's read this. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten, but while they made ready... He fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth, wherein, all, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. So who's involved in this story? This is Peter and Jesus. Look at, look at the, the reference. This is Acts chapter 10. You know, this is after Saul. This is Peter now. And he's hearing from God. Do you get that? We're New Testament. After the, after salvation, you know, after the crucifixion, uh, resurrection from the dead, ascension to heaven, poured out of the Holy Ghost, somebody, ten, you know, eight chapters after Pentecost, hearing from God. So if they can hear from God, you can hear from God. And this is only a couple examples. We could go page by page through the entire book of Acts telling you people that heard from God. I'm just pulling out certain examples for some really big understanding purposes. So who's involved in the story? It's Peter and Jesus. Peter's on the housetop, hears from Jesus. Now what does Peter get in this vision? Why does Peter get in this vision? This is intentional time with the Lord that he goes up onto the housetop to pray and he fast. You know, the story before here in Acts 9, Saul wasn't fasting when he heard, but after he heard, he immediately fasted so he could hear more clearly. You know, he asked the Lord, what do you want me to do? The Lord said, go into the city and it will be told to you. And the first thing he does is fast. If it's going to be told, I want to hear. So, so I want to make sure that there's no distractions in my life. There is a natural fast, removing of food. It doesn't move God. It's not like a hunger strike that when you fast, you hunger strike and God finally speaks to you. But when you food fast, what you're doing is you're, uh, you're disciplining the flesh and making the flesh submit to the spirit. The natural implication of fasting brings forth spiritual promises because what you're doing is not moving God, but you're moving yourself into position to hear more clearly. Now listen, you don't have to fast to hear the Lord. There's plenty of examples in the Bible where people didn't fast and heard the Lord. But fasting is a way to hear God more clearly. So I always tell people when they say, well, I don't hear from God, I say, well, the Bible says you hear from God, so that's the truth. I said, if you want to hear God more clearly, then you need to pray, and you need to read the Bible, and you need to fast. You know, if you've got a lot of distractions going on, turn the distractions off. Cut the TV off. Cut the news off. Turn your social media off. Get the distractions out of your life so you can hear God more clearly. 
There's some natural things you can do to help the spiritual process. And remember, I'm going to say this again. I'll say this every time I talk about prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting does not move God. Prayer and fasting moves you. It does not move God. This is also important because in Acts 10, what Peter sees in this vision is what ends up being the first sermon preached to the Gentiles. Because at the same time Peter is hearing this, Cornelius had prayed just before this in Acts chapter 10, and he had heard from God. So Cornelius hears from God. He sends the men to Joppa. Peter's up on the rooftop praying. The men from Joppa get there. They go with Peter, and Peter ends up back with Cornelius in Acts 10. He said, of a truth I perceive, God is no respecter of persons. The first sermon ever preached to the Gentiles was because of somebody intentionally wanting to hear from God. That's the lesson you get. God is no respecter of persons. How does this teach us to hear from God? It talking about an intentional time with God in prayer. Intentionality is the big thing I want you to see today. It's being intentional. Every time that these great, you know, men and women of God did mighty things, a lot of I'm not going to say every time because some of the times like we see in the Bible the person hearing from God wasn't always initiating the interaction. Sometimes God just showed up to them. But there is these great moves of God almost always come from an intentionality to hear from God. That I know I hear from God. And I want to separate myself out and I want to put a focus on hearing. Let me say this. A focus of hearing from God without a willingness to obey will bring forth destruction in your life. And you might you might say, what does that mean? This is Hosea 4 6. Hosea 4 6 says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge. There is something understanding that if you don't know God's voice and you haven't heard from God, you can be destroyed because of the things you don't know. What you don't know is killing you. But it gets even worse than that, that if you do know, which means you've heard from God, and you choose to reject it, it will bring destruction in your life. It's, uh, it's one of the glorious things of the word, but it's one of the dark sides of hearing God, is that if you reject it, you will bring destruction in your life. So I want to make this statement and then we're going to we're going to finish this lesson and then I really want to get to this one piece of additional resource before we run out of time. If you want to hear from God, you need to make a decision beforehand. I'm going to obey God. When I hear from God, I will obey God. That needs to be a decision you make before you hear. Because what you hear might be a hard thing, but what you hear is God. And God will always take care of you if you walk in a spirit of obedience to him. Let's keep going. I'm telling you, if you listen to last semester's, last semester was so very different than what we're doing today. Um, the Lord is bringing some real deep truth today. And I, and I believe somebody really needs to hear what I'm, what I'm saying. I'm, I'm coming stronger than I did last semester. But there's some really deep truth about this that you have to catch a hold of. And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at the time that Eli was laid down in his place. And his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. And Samuel was laid down to sleep that the Lord called Samuel and he answered, Here am I. Now, this is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Uh, most people have never even heard this story, but this is definitely one of my favorites. And, and 1 Samuel 3. Because Samuel's asleep when God calls to him. Now when he hears this, he runs to Eli three times. He hears something, and he runs to Eli. He goes, here am I. And Eli said, I didn't call you. Go back to sleep. It happens three times. And on the third time, Eli knows that it's God. And he says, if you hear it again, he said, then... Uh, it's God, and then let God speak to you. And on the fourth encounter, Samuel has this divine encounter with God. So what does this teach us about hearing the voice of God? 
We know the voice of God when he calls us. When he called out to Samuel, Samuel said, here am I, he heard it. Now he runs to Eli three times, but then Eli receives the, like Eli perceives, he goes, oh, it's God. I didn't even, listen to this. Eli never heard it was God. Eli never heard the voice, but he knew it was God that was speaking to Samuel. So even other people will know it's God speaking to you when you say what God said. That's good right there. Hold on, I'm going to write that down. I didn't, that's a revelation in and of itself. Eli knew it was God. Hallelujah. Somebody needed that. That, that even, even Eli, who never heard the voice that Samuel heard, knew it was God. I'm going to let you go back and read that on your own. Now listen to this. A call of God usually involves further action. And I put usually, but I, I'm, I'm going to say this more clearly. Always. And you, let's just put always. Every time God speaks to you, it requires a corresponding action. You moving in accordance with God. When you hear from God, be not afraid to speak if someone asks. Now, this is important because in this story, Samuel hears from God. And then Eli tells him, Tell me what God said. Well, the word that God gave Samuel about Eli was not a good word for Eli. But he still gave it. So the thing I want you to understand is when God speaks to you and he tells you, you can't be afraid to walk it out. You can't be afraid to speak according to what God said. You got to be willing to walk it out. And the things I want you to know is you have to make this decision ahead of time to go after the Lord no matter what and to obey his commandments no matter what comes next. Whatever the call is, whatever the word is, whatever God speaks, you have to be willing to obey and you should make that decision ahead of time. Uh, to give you a couple uh, understanding, there's, there's plenty of additional resources on the website. We're done with the lesson. We're going to talk about something else before we finish. But if you want to go into the lesson, there's some or the additional resources. There's some stuff on prayer and fasting, uh, God being a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path, being able to show you the way, and that comes from knowing God's voice. There's some instances of Jesus separating himself to go spend time intentionally with the Father to hear from God that, that deals with that um, that, that intimacy with God that we talked about last week. Uh, Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, that you have to hear from God to have faith in God. And so many people have a wrong understanding of faith, and I'm not going to go into this fully today. We'll talk about it more in the coming weeks. But the only way you can be connected to somebody is if you hear from them. Ooh, somebody just got that. Friendships? The closest friends are the friends that talk all the time. You know, I, I have I have a buddy down in Alabama, and me and him are super close. I mean, we're like brothers, and we've been like this for years. I mean, ever since we met in college, we've been, I mean, we're tight. We, I, like, I know everything about him. He knows everything about me. I know things about him before he says it. I mean, I know this man. You know, I've known him for a long time, too. You know, almost 10 years now. And... Me and him have not lived in the same city in seven years. You know, we, we, we haven't even been close to the same city in like seven years. You know, it's been a long time since we've lived in the same spot. But we're still super tight. And there's friends that, he, that we have there in Alabama that he lives, that live right down the street from him, 15, 20 minutes from him. And they're drifting apart. Well, why can those relationships drift apart when they're so close in proximity, but me and him who are so far in proximity still have one of the closest relationships I have with anybody? Well, the reason for that is because we talk all the time. That the, the focus of intimacy and the focus of being able to know somebody comes from talking with them. You know, the more clearly you talk, the deeper the connection goes. The same thing with God. 
the more you know this Bible and you sit here and you read this word and you pray and you fast and you remove the distractions and you pray and you read this word because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, the deeper the connection to God you will have. You know, it's not that God changes, but your the, the intimate relationship with the Lord grows the more you spend time in this Bible and in prayer seeking God. You will hear God more clearly when you do that. So, and there, there's so many more that you can uh, go into and read in the additional resources. I'm not going to go into any more of those today because I want to talk about something that I mentioned in our daily teachings. Uh, hold on a second, I'm going to write this down so we've got it. I mentioned this in our daily teachings, I believe, a week ago. And it directly tied into this lesson today. And the Lord was speaking to me last night. He said, I want you to teach that revelation in your discipleship class. Make sure that they hear what you said during the daily teachings. So in case you missed our daily teachings, this is the revelation I want to give you. In 1 Kings 17, God speaks to Elijah. And when he speaks to Elijah to go to the brook Cherith, and when he speaks to Elijah to go to Zarephath, in both of those instances, and if you want more information, I have like 26 parts of teaching on this. You know, I have 29 uh, sermons on this chapter right now, and we're, we're doing more and more every day. So go and watch all those if you want more on Elijah. But listen to this. In verse 2 and in verse 8, it says the exact same. It's word for word the exact same. Listen to what it says. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying. Now, you might say, what, what does that mean? Now, the word came unto him, saying. Now, the word saying is the same word said in the past tense. Saying is the present tense. But that's the physical action of the word coming out. That's the sound waves coming from the mouth of God and to your ear. The movement of sound is the saying part. Okay? That makes sense. You know, something came out. So something was said. What was said? The word was said. Okay? So God's word was said. So you have a word and it was said. It was pushed out of God's mouth. This is really important. So I'm, I'm being very specific that you don't miss this. So when it says the word of the Lord came unto him saying, what I want you to go to is Genesis 11. And we're going to look at the failure of man. Then we're going to talk about the Tower of Babel. So let's listen to this. And the whole earth was of one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Sinir and they dwelt there. And they made one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they made, and they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the tower, the, the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they all have one language, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the languages of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Okay, that's the story of the Tower of Babel. I'm going to go through this revelation pretty fast, so you just got to hang tight. The Tower of Babel is not about height of building. It's not like they got eight stories, and if they got 40 stories, then they would finally get into heaven. I mean, the, the Sears Tower in, here in Chicago, it's pretty high. But you're, st I mean, you go to the very top. I've been to the very top. There's, God ain't there. You know, like, 
There, there's no angels and you know gold streets at the top of the Sears Tower. You know, I mean that's that's not. You, it doesn't reach into heaven because of its height. I mean, we have rocket ships that blast you into space. You know, there's. It's not talking about that the Tower of Babel was dealing about the height of a building. The Tower of Babel is referencing to the fact that the people were doing what they could to make their own way to God. That through their own works and through their own methods, they could find an alternative way to God, into heaven. That's what the Tower of Babel is. That's why in the book of the Revelation... It's all about getting people to understand their, everybody gets the same language so that way they can make their own way to God. This is where rebellion and idolatry come to the greatest extent in the generation that the Lord returns. The generation that the Lord returns is going to be one of the greatest revivals ever in history because the, the, the gospel can go forth because we all understand you know, that the languages start to be understood by everybody. But also it will be the greatest time of idolatry and rebellion against God because the people will then try to find their own way to God. That's all I'm going to say about that because I want to tell you this. Listen to what this says in Genesis 11.1. 1, and the whole earth was of one language and one speech. Language and speech are two different words. Now the word speech is the word that God gave to Elijah. The word of the Lord came on him saying... The thing that proceeded out of the mouth of God to Elijah was speech, not language. You might say, Cody, what's the difference? Language is the different... Language refers to the lip. Speech refers to the tongue. Let me explain. Languages would be English, Spanish, French, Chinese, Russian. The different, spe the different languages of the world. You know, uh, we all speak different languages. Even in the same language, like English, you have different ways in which people use it. You know, you got that northern Boston accent. You got that southern, you know, that southern, uh, that southern accent. You know, ev diff even different parts in the United States have different, like, languages because the lip causes it to sound different. But listen to this. The word speech refers to the actual words. So when you say hey in English and you say hola in Spanish, they're different languages, but the meaning of the word is the same. That's the speech. The speech is the word itself. It's what it intends to do. So if you say thank you and you say gracias, you know, in Spanish, they two different sounds. They're two different languages. The lip changes how they sound. But the speech, the actual word itself, means the exact same thing. That's So when God confounded, and if you read later on, when God confounded the languages that they might not understand one speech, what he confounded was the lip, not the tongue. So the lip changed, that, that, that's now why we have English, Spanish, German, French, all of those different languages. But the meaning behind the words stayed the same. The speech is the same. So in 1 Kings 17, when the Lord spoke to Elijah, he spoke to him in the same speech. The reason why this is so important is the only way that Elijah could walk out divine purpose with God is Elijah had not only to hear some sound waves come in his ear. It couldn't just be a language. You know, if God spoke, if, if all you knew was English and God only spoke to you in Spanish, you'd never understand what to do. You know, because you couldn't understand it, you wouldn't be able to follow God. But that's not how God does things. The revelation in 1 Kings 17 is that when God speaks, he speaks to you in the same speech being able to be understood by you. When God speaks to you, he speaks clearly and you can understand everything that God says to you. There's no misunderstanding with God. There's no confusion with God. You know God's voice. You can hear it. Now, let me say, this is. I'm going to finish with this 
I stopped in saying it earlier because I wanted to wait to the very end to say it. So many people that I, I ministered to and, you know, we're only very early in this curriculum. So we got a lot to go. And, and as we go, it'll make more sense what I'm about to say as we go through the following weeks. You hear God. You hear God clearly. The difference is that the, if God says you hear God and the Bible is truth, then you do hear God. Now, if you say you don't hear God, you are in direct opposition to the word. Now, I would say out of 100%, there are, 10 there are probably 10% of people that are sincere when they say, I don't hear God, that really need to know how to hear God. They need somebody to tell them, knowing God's voice. They need to hear this lesson because they need to hear that you do hear God. I need to replace that lie with the truth. And I need to tell you, you know, you need to separate yourself out. Go to the mountain. Go, go to different places and, and seek the Lord. Put a focus on hearing. Because you do hear, you just need to maybe get into a place where you remove distractions to hear easier. Sometimes it's just easier to hear. You know, that's what I would say. You can hear at all times. And maybe you just need to, maybe you need some help making it easier to hear so it becomes easier over time. You know, and I would say that's probably 10% of people. But I would say, and this is just from the, the experience I have ministering in the body of Christ, 90% of people do not struggle with hearing God's voice. They might say it, but they don't struggle with hearing God's voice. Because the more I talk to them and having these conversations, the more it comes out that they heard from God. It's not, a, it's not a matter of hearing. It's a matter of obeying. And let me say this, and we're going to finish. You cannot receive any promise of God unless you obey what God has told you to do. The provision of God comes in obedience to God. You cannot receive outside of obedience to God. Because anything outside of obedience and faith in God is sin. And you cannot receive in sin. You can receive in obedience. Now, I'm not saying there's not grace and there's not mercy. And we're going to talk about some of these things in the next couple of weeks that God will sustain you in failure. Because he will sustain you in failure to bring you back. But a heart of rebellion will lead to destruction. So here's the two things I want to give you today and we're going to finish. The first thing I want to tell you today is you hear God's voice. You hear it. It's in the same speech, it's easy to understand, and it is directly from God. And listen, God loves you so very much. He wants you to hear Him, and you do hear Him. And the next thing I want you to know is that if you will obey Him and follow with Him, you will receive everything that God has ordained for your life. And the last thing I want to tell you is if you're having a hard time hearing, you do hear, but maybe it's just hard then separate yourself out. Go back to last week and put a focus on intimacy. Put a focus on spending time with the Lord. Because the more you grow in intimacy with God, the easier it will be to hear from God. Because it comes from this close, familiar relationship where the voice of God becomes the easiest to hear. And we're going to stop there. If you have questions, please send your questions and I'll be more, more than happy to answer anything for you. The answers are online and I'll update the additional resources today. So, Father, I thank you. Bless this class, God. Let them grow in understanding and hearing your voice. I thank you for all that you're doing. I give you all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Class, I love you. Have a wonderful night. We'll see you next Monday at 7 p.m. Have a great day.